All right, thanks everybody for joining. Welcome to this week's office hour session. I am thrilled to be joined by Chuck Rackley, our Chief Strategy Officer here at Infinix. Um, I'm Kate Tingley, Director of Marketing, and it's always, always a pleasure to host folks here on the session. Um, this week, we are going to focus on how you can leverage automation to improve your revenue cycle results, your revenue cycle workflows. So before we dive into some of the tactics and best practices, let's start by just what is RPA and defining that because I think for some folks it's still a little bit of a new term. Yeah, it's it's something that's a bit of a hot button issue right now, and and some people are diving full force in, some people are dipping a toe in the water, and there's a couple of reasons for that. So let's just like you said, let's start from the very beginning. Let's define the term. So RPA stands for Robotic Process Automation. So the first thing everyone thinks about when they're talking about RPA is that I, I get a picture of the Terminator 2 skull, right, with the red the red eyes. Oh no, the robots are going to take over everything. Um, it's, it's a little little dramatic, but uh, some people think that the, the easiest way to explain it is is think about like those old school Microsoft Excel macros, like where you you have some sort of keystroke emulation where it's going to act like it did something for you, like a real person. So if if you if anyone listening has ever done those those old mac macros in Visual Basic um, back in the '90s or 2000s, that's essentially what it is, but just on a much bigger scale, and it can do a little bit more decision making um, as it goes along. So I think a lot of folks listen to RPA and what it can do, and think that's great, but it might be too good to be true. So does it yeah. really work? It does. It does work. Um, so the important thing to know about RPA is that you can't you can't just dive into it with with uh, both hands and ex expect to automate your entire workflow process. Mm -hmm. The important thing to do is take uh, small, meaningful chunks um, and do some things in steps. So I'm sure everyone's heard some of these bad horror stories of those those big, huge RPA houses and in, in, out there in the market that will try to automate the entire rev cycle and the entire acute the clinical care and all this stuff. And it kind of goes haywire because it's it's a very heavy lift to try to do this. So what's important is to take the, like I said, these small chunks and start to do pieces of processes instead of just doing an entire process. Like you wouldn't want to automate your entire denials process, but maybe you can automate just the medical records process. So there's, there's little pieces of it that become very, very helpful almost think of it like an Iron Man suit. So instead of just you flying around, flapping your wings, you have something to help you out and automate a few things for you. What is the difference between component architecture and single thread architecture? So the, the normal problem with an RPA bot, and so the word bot, that's what we call it, an individual section of, of automation. The big problem with it is that it breaks. So where let's let's say for example we've built a bot to go out to the availability website and, and check account status. Okay, so it goes out there. It's going to go through the login system. It's going to enter the account number or the encounter number, whatever it is. Bring back a process and bring it back into our our accounting system. Now availability has their own group of nerds that are trying to stop everybody from doing this sometimes. Um, sometimes not on purpose. Sometimes it is. So they'll move the spot where a button is. Uh, the, the, they'll add another click that you got to get through and it'll break your bot. Mm -hmm. And what's and that, that's a bad thing, obviously, because obviously someone has to go in and fix that every single time. But the difference where component architecture comes in is that think about each one of those steps. So the, the clicking of the login button, the putting your cursor in the username button, the clicking the copy and paste, each one of those is put into a different component and we call those microbots. So those those you have you have thousands or hundreds of these mini bots that are going into the overall process. So that some that thing I just said of we're going to log into availability where it sounds like one step actually has about 10. And the reason that's important is if if you have all these things all in one long string of of macro or or RPA bot if it breaks that means you have to go and fix each individual spot that that's looking at. If you have a component architecture and, you, and let's say you have a, a client, uh, if you're a, an RPA vendor that has 30 clients that are all looking at the availability website and that one thing in the website breaks, you can just fix that one component and it feed everybody. So if you had built individual bots for every single person, 
you would have to go in and fix each individual one. And that's what's so important about having those component pieces that you can lift and replace and put in different spots if, if something improves or breaks. And that means you don't have to maintain all those different areas of RPA uh, logic. Does that make sense? It does. And also, I think that you brought up a really good point. That's a good question that if folks are looking to implement any sort of RPA technology to ask the vendor mm -hmm. how that works. Yeah, big time. And, and you can you can actually do a lot, a lot there on improving the bots over time. And this is something that is really, really important. And I think it's really cool in the, in the RPA space, especially in healthcare right now. So in, in the history, you have everyone kind of having this is this is my cheese. This is my my uh, intellectual property. I'm going to own this forever. But what's interesting about the RPA world is that people are much more willing to share. So if 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 I've got if I figured out and I, let's say we did an RPA bot for a client A and we set it up, an, that, let's stick with that availability example that it's going to go out and check account status. And then we do that same setup for 10 of the people. But on number 10, we figure out, OK, on this is a little bit better way to do that or they had an idea of, of a way to do it better. We can take that one little component and go put it on everybody else too. So it, everyone can kind of share all those, the best and brightest that's always happening. And so the, the bots are continually evolving over time and making it better for you. So how long does it typically take and you know what are the timeframes to implement a bot? Yeah, it's it's a it's a big sliding scale, right? Uh, but the you know it, let's let's talk about like a simple process of okay, let's log into let's stick with that availability example. So if you're just logging into availability, checking account status on one payer, that can take as little as you know a couple of weeks to make what's called the process definition document. So that's the PDD. That's basically every single iteration that's going to happen over the time of using that bot. Now this is this is where people get frustrated with it. So let's 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 go do use a, a real world example. So if I said, make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and automate that process, you know it's really simple to say, okay, take the bread, put peanut butter on it, put jelly on the other piece, put it together. Now what happens if there's no knives in the drawer, or if there is the peanut butter is kind of stuck to the sides, or the peanut butter is out and you need to go get another jar halfway through. So there's all these different things called edge edge cases, which are, okay, what about this? What about this? What about this? And that's what takes so long is you have to map each one of those out. Now, now there is a, a diminishing level of return. So if you get to say 95, 97% of all cases possible, that's pretty good. You can go with that and put it in, 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 a, in a live environment, um, it, but you wouldn't wanna go live if you only had 50% recorded. And that's where you get dangerous. That's where you get a lot of breaks and a lot of exceptions where it's going to put back into your people's queues. Uh, so that's that's what takes a little while. You have to do each and every single iteration of what's there. So on average, we'll call it between three weeks and six weeks, it should take to install a single bot. Would you agree that if someone is telling you that they can do it in a shorter time frame or you know, if, is that a red flag? Because <laughs> maybe they're not yeah. really learning process or. So the, there, are, if, if you were coming from complete scratch and they said they can do it in two weeks, uh, red flags would go off for me. But if they were like an established vendor that said, yeah, I can install that account status check in three weeks because I've done it 700 times and I've mapped out all the payers. All we need to do is map your specific instance. That's a little different. That's another reason that component architecture is so important is because you can have all those things and use them over and over again, rather than making something from the beginning. So if that if you have a vendor that's saying, yeah, we can do it really fast because of X, Y, and Z, that's okay. But if they're saying they're gonna make something specific for you in that amount of time, that would throw up red flags for me for sure. That's really helpful. What are the differences between attended and unattended bots? Yeah, so an unattended bot is one that works without you doing anything. So think of it like a person just logging into a work queue. So you're going to actually, most of the time, you actually assign the bot a specific work queue like it's a person. So that's why you hear all these things like in the marketplace, they call their bot something like a person's name because they're trying to personify it a little bit. So an unattended bot is going to go out to the work queue and work it until it can't anymore. And it's going to spell everything back to a different queue that it couldn't work. An attended bot is something that you have to kick off. And a, a good example 
is I've seen a bot in the past where if, if you were doing a resubmission to a payer um, and you wanted to automate the, the whole process of uploading a medical record, uh, tying it to the account and notating something, you can make an attendant bot that you would have to kick off yourself with a, with a, with a certain uh, a keystroke or a button or some, some sort of shortcut that we could put in there for you. So what, what you would happen is you have, that's more like the Iron Man scenario where you have something that you kick off individually every single time versus some, something that is working autonomously completely by itself. Both have use cases. Um, so where you wouldn't want to use the bot every time um, and others are work where you want to use it every time and you just feed it to that specific work queue. That makes sense, Kate? It does, it does, thank you. So we've all been talking a lot over the last six months here about all of the staffing challenges that everybody's facing across all healthcare provider types. And I think there's there's been a lot of focus on how can we leverage technology to help with some of this work. So if I'm a provider in that scenario, how can I how can I use RPA in my patient access process or my billing and revenue recovery process? And can that help me with lowering the number of staff that I actually need to do that process because I'm I'm challenged right now with staff and, and getting yeah. everything done. For sure. And, and this is this comes into probably a question that's coming up on, on how you assess value of, of the bot it is and, and the first one and the most obvious one is, is FTE savings. So you can actually absolutely use RPA for FTE savings. Um, the important thing is, is I'm gonna say this a thousand times is not to try to do something that's too big. So when you're first putting your toe in the water of the RPA pool, look for things that are more menial in nature. So if, if you know, and this happens so often, I, I still can't believe in healthcare. If you know that all this person is doing is going and changing a status of, of this account from a one to a two every time it has this on it, and then it, then it resubmits the claim, something, something very simple that has a few steps in it is much easy, much more easy to automate. It's much more easy to develop, and it's less likely to break on you. So, if you're having those staffing needs, do some do some analysis on okay, what are the specific use cases that are, are pretty menial in nature, um, don't change a lot, uh, and and would be a good FTE balance for you to for you to take those people and put them towards something more meaningful um, that you can do rather than having to do the menial task. That's kind of step one. Step two is you can start looking at those tasks that are a little more complex, like denial submission, notice of admission, things that have some decision making to do. Um, that's where that, that process definition document is gonna be much longer. You're gonna have a lot more things to discuss, a lot more edge cases to cover, um, but those are things you can do over time. But the immediate ones, the menial projects are the most impactful that I've found so far. That's helpful. So it sounds like looking at your process, and the tasks that are involved and what are what are the simplest that don't require mm -hmm. a set of human hands to get it done. So that makes sense. Right. Yep. Anything else you would add in terms of how you assess value in RPA? Yeah, for sure. So and there's three major ways to assess value of an RPA bot or an implementation. Um, the first, like we talked about, is straight FTE savings. So over time, you can either eliminate an FTE or move them on to something else, but you can, you can do this if the process is perfected enough where you can get it to 95, 97% effectiveness of the bot, so where it drops that FTE requirement completely. Um, the second one, and maybe the most important one, is something I touched on a second ago. So instead of absolutely just terming that employee, you can have them upskill to do something more meaningful. And this, is, get, this gets overlooked a lot, I think, in our, in our market today especially with people that are only pushing, hey, if you hire us, we can help you fire 10 people. Sometimes that doesn't go down well um, and at all, it's, depending on the culture you're in. And no one ever likes to see someone lose their job. But I've also never seen a rev cycle in my 20 some odd years of doing this that has every account covered no matter what. There's always something else to do in this business. There's always something else you can be doing or getting ready for or prepping the next thing or doing some other denial or underpayment recovery. So instead of looking at this as purely an FTE savings, and you can definitely do that, think about this, what, what, what can you do to upskill these employees 
and these colleagues of yours into something more meaningful for them and ultimately for your, for your uh, provider network or health system or hospital, whatever it may be. Um, that one's the second one. The third is bots, are, without a, a better term, if they're programmed correctly, they're smarter than us. <laughs> they, they make less mistakes. They don't, they don't fat finger things like I do. They don't miss uh, numbers. They, they don't make many mistakes and usually have a quality um, increase when your bot is, is well made. So a, a good example of this is, is that denial submission um, example we've been talking about a little bit, where you find, we, I found in the past where you, let's say you had a, a 70% um, approval rating or an overturn rate on a, on a human, you may uptick that another 5%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have you know, a two or $300 million system or you know, a, a 300 doc practice, these things really kind of snowball on you. So if you can increase your, your overall overturn rate just by a few percentage points, you feel that at the end of the day, and that's that's direct income statement benefit. So that drops right to your bottom line. It's not even balance sheet. You get it over and over again. So those three things. So FTE savings, your upskilling time that you're moving, and then the quality improvement that you have on your current process. That's such a good point. I don't think I've ever seen a hospital like you or a provider that has staff sitting around with nothing to do. <laughs> the majority yeah. of them have too much work and can't get to it all. Um, so even if you're not understaffed and have open positions, free up that time so that they can focus on, like you said, more meaningful tasks, patient care, those For types sure. of things. Yeah. Where do you see the market going? I mean, the technology is here. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got these solutions. Are, are we starting to see hospitals embrace the technology? Yeah, you know, there's been there were a few early adopters that that have really tackled this. Um, and but I'm starting to see more and more people, not done just in the big hospital health systems, not not just the banners and HCAs and tenants. I'm starting to see this in the single hospital and even some some large um, physician providers and even small physician providers. It makes sense for. Um, so I'm starting to see this all across the market, um, but it, to varying degrees. Um, and I only see this getting bigger. But the most important thing that I, I, I see happening in the market is RPA bots taking the next step for you. So the, the first example we talked about, Kate, was, was going out to availability to get that account status. So there's plenty of companies out there that do this today. So I can name five or six of them that either do it through some sort of direct connection with the payer, an RPA bot, or, or some sort of automation that's going out and screen scraping for you. Um, there's, there's plenty of those vendors that do that, right? Um, and they all bring them back in. What very few people do is do, doing account statusing plus do something. So most of them just go, back, go out there, grab something and bring it back. Very few actually take the next step for you. So where I see this market heating up and really getting big in the next couple of months and years is taking that base RPA bot that everyone's using and then taking the next step of it and making a decision. So you have these things called neural nets that are almost like synthetic brains that say, okay, if it's this, I can do this. If it's this, I do this. And they learn and they get better over time at making these decisions. So what I see happening in the next couple months and the years, like I said, is just that a next evolution of the bot starting to take more and more and more um, opportunity to save us cash, um, which is exciting. And, and it's something that, you know, a lot of people are skeptical that it's gonna work. Um, I'm one of them for sure for a long time, but I, I've seen it work a few times now and uh, across a several different health systems and save a ton of cash. And, and this is only gonna kind of compound on each other. Um, but what's important to do, and this is the, probably the most important part of when you build RPA bots, is to not automate a bad process. It's, it's something I've heard referred to as paving the goat path, right? So you can, you can pave a goat path, but at the end of the day, it's still a meandering goat path that doesn't go anywhere. Um, it's much better to straighten out these processes and then pave it. So that's the next, uh, something else I see happening in the market that instead of just hey, uh, I'm going to put a uh, developer sitting with your collectors or your billers and have them automate what they're talking about. I'm seeing them start to, uh, really good people start to put in some RevCycle experts and healthcare experts are saying, 
yeah, we could do that, but it would be better if we just change this process to patient access so they can not get this denial anymore. Let's automate that. Um, or or let's, let's change a few things on the front end so that doesn't happen in the back end. Um, there's a lot of examples of that happening where we're starting to fix processes ahead of time instead of just having all this code out there to automate these bad processes. So th those are two, two points that I see in the market that are changing more and more. Um, instead of just having developers um, and coders do this stuff um, in a vacuum with some collectors, they're actually starting to really put some, some pr pros in there as far as rep cycle experts. That's really interesting because I think, yeah, it's so easy for <laughs> providers and hospitals to go in and say, I need this process automated. But in reality, take a step back, <laughs> right. Let's look at the process and determine whether or not it's the most streamlined process, the most effective process before just implementing something that may or may not be necessary. Right. So, what are you seeing um, in terms of big and small folks in the RPA space? There's a lot, a lot of folks entering this space in healthcare. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing as the biggest differences Oh, I think what, what I just said is probably the biggest one. So the, the biggest one I see is, and, and you know, I'll go ahead and name the 10,000 pound gorilla. So all of is the 10,000 pound gorilla, right? They're the ones that cornered the market in RPA. Um, they have excellent developers. Um, and traditionally, they have not employed the rep cycle experts that some of the others have. Um, that is starting to change. They, they've gotten that message and they're starting to employ them. But most of the smaller providers that I've worked with in the past that are um, not mom and pop, but, you know, maybe one step above that where they've maybe worked at some other places before and started their own business, or maybe they've worked with automation anywhere or somewhere else and started their own, their own shop. They're only employing what we talked about earlier, those rep cycle experts or those clinical experts that can really get down into detail and get stuff correct. Um, that, that can do some of this process documentation without even the collectors there because they know how it should work. Um, that's the biggest difference I see with them. Um, I also don't see those smaller vendors biting off too much um, very often. So, you know, you see the, the, the mammoth vendor saying, okay, we want to sign a $10 million deal with you to automate everything. Um, you, you don't see that much from the smaller guys. You, you see them say, okay, we were going to help you with one or two bots first, and then kind of build on it. Um, you have much less of a commitment in that situation. So you have some flexibility there that you don't have with a huge vendor. Um, so if, and especially if you want to dip a toe rather than dive headfirst in with, with uh, no life jacket, um, it can be a little less um, trepid, trepidatious for, to go that way. Does that make sense? It does. I think those of us that have been in healthcare a while, you know, you certainly realize how important that experience is. And, you know, mm -hmm. for somebody coming from a different industry to try to create a solution. And it, it's one of the industries that I think takes the longest to learn and to really understand. I mean, we have a, um, we almost have a completely different language you know, yeah. when you start to think okay. about it. Um, it's, it's a challenge. So I think that's, that's really good advice to make sure that you're talking to someone that actually has rev cycle expertise versus, you know, somebody that maybe comes from a tech background, but a different industry and is building a solution. Right. Now, not, not to say that there is not advantages to going with the big guys too. So I, I want to make this right down the middle. So the, th the advantage you get with going with the bigger guys is that they have that much, the, the track record in the past. So think back to that first conversation, one of the first conversations we had today on component architecture. They've got thousands of those, whereas the, the, the smaller up providers don't have that many. So you have this big, huge uh, bolus of RPA to pick from that's going to be faster and faster to install. It's going to break less and it's going to be easier to install on a single basis. So there, there are some advantages of going there. Um, it, but you, again, you get what you pay for um, in most of those cases. Awesome. So I want to give everybody a chance to ask some questions if you've got them. Um, feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A, um, and we'll get those answered for you. All right, first question for you, Chuck. Um, we just talked a little bit about differences between big and small. If I'm looking to implement RPA, what questions should I be asking a potential vendor? Mm -hmm. 
Um, a couple of them that come to mind are, um, are, are you going to own the content or am I? So, and that, that really comes down to, are you going to pay for the license for the RPA um, infrastructure or are you going to license it from your vendor? Um, if you want to own that content forever and not be charged like SaaS on a continuous basis, you're going to have to set that up and it's a little more expensive on the front end, but it might be cheaper in the long end. If you don't care about that and you just want the subscription and you want it to work that way, it'll be cheaper on the, on the front end, but you just have to pay for it as long as you're using it, then go with that. That's an important question to ask. Um, the, the second one is like we've talked about already, who do you have that knows what the heck they're doing? Um, that, that's a very good question and, and you want some examples of things they've done in the past, things they've automated in the past um, and ask them some of these pitfalls. Like where have you seen just flat out fail? Why do they fail? What are the edge case? What is your, your strategy on edge case handling? Um, another one is how do you know if something breaks? So if, if everything is coming along um, and all of a sudden the bot isn't working anymore, how fast can you fix it? Um, what, what are the SLAs you're going to put in place to get it back running again? Um, and how, how will you continuously learn and get better over time? Um, those, are, those are good ones to ask. All right. One more question for you. Where do I yep. start? <laughs> I think it can be really overwhelming for healthcare providers, hospitals. Mm -hmm. There's probably a million different you know, little tasks that I could, I could automate, but any advice on where to start? Yeah, I, I would I would start with doing some self analysis on looking for those easy processes. So mm -hmm. once you find a couple of those that your people are saying, hey, every time I do this, it's just a stupid click I have to do. It just takes me so much time to do this. Or you have a whole team of people that are just changing statuses, um, and you can do it. Find it. Find a couple of those examples. Or if you have a, a work queue that's always full and you never get through it. Find a couple of those examples before you reach out to a vendor to help to work with you, um, to, to at least give them some places to start. Um, and, and obviously go into, go into everything with, a, with an open mind, um, be skeptical of everything now, um, and, and want some proof points would be the first one. I think you brought up a really good point. You need to talk to your staff. <laughs> Yeah. Don't just assume yeah. you understand what a process is and isn't, you know, um, the folks that do that role every day, day in and day out, they understand where, where the challenges are, where the breaks are in process. So before just implementing something that's, that you think is going to be a huge bonus, ask your people, Yep. let them tell you. That's the I mean, that's something that everyone needs to remember um, as executives and managers and directors. Right. Is, right. Sometimes we're so far removed from the actual work, we forget what, what's terrible and what needs to be automated versus what's okay and I can do it myself. Um, so that's yeah, something I always need to remember for sure. We all do. We all do for sure. We hope everybody has a great evening and look forward to seeing you back here next week. Thanks so much, Chuck. Lots of really, really good information. Bye, everybody. See you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.